Welcome back. Welcome back. Throughout the programme, we've been focusing, of course, on the Berlin Wall. But let's look now in more detail about the way Europe was divided. From 1945 until 1989, Europe was split in two. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste over here in the Adriatic. Winston Churchill said in his 1946 speech in Fulton, an iron curtain had fallen over the continent. On one side were the countries of uh, Europe there, Western Europe, and on the other, over here, those of the Warsaw Pact, all of them under the influence of Moscow. No dissent was permitted when any country, as Hungary did in 1956, tried to loosen the grip. They were met with Soviet tanks on their streets. For more than four decades, the communist regime in Eastern Europe appeared impregnable. But behind the Iron Curtain, there were beginning to be real problems. When Mikhail Gorbachev came to power in 1985, the Soviet Union was in a period of economic decline and political stagnation. But while these problems were severe, the revolutionary wave that swept through Eastern and Central Europe in 1989 took people on both sides of the Iron Curtain by surprise. People everywhere can remember the pictures of the Berlin Wall being bulldozed. But the first opening in the Iron Curtain actually took place a few months earlier, in Hungary. In May 1989, the Hungarian Prime Minister, Miklos Nemeth, gave the order to start dismantling the barbed wire and electric fence that divided Hungary from Western Europe. It encouraged hundreds of East Germans to the border, for a celebratory pan-European picnic, and many then crossed the border into Austria and the West. Earlier, I caught up with Miklos Nemeth, who told me what Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev said to him about his idea of opening the fence and effectively lowering the Iron Curtain. On the fence, yes. he said, I don't see any problem, because it's your responsibility to secure your borders, because there are drug traffickers, there are traffic uh, uh, weaponry uh, issues in, in this case, because some dealers can smuggle in and out through, through a loose border uh, weapons. It's your responsibility. I said to him, we have been working on a new system, but this fence on the Hungarian-Austrian border is, a, is an anachronism is a sort of, sort of uh, 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 bad thing for, for the two So countries. you were probably surprised to a certain extent by the fact that uh, that was uh, Mikhail Gorbachev's response. Um, and events moved fast after that. So as soon he, as... He assured... Did he assure you that he, he would not put the Russian troops on uh, active... Now, uh, that assurance came after I asked a very important question. I don't know when the first VB, uh, free elections will be held in Hungary, but I can assure you, Mihail Sergeyevich, that after 40 years of tyranny, of one-party system, if I am sitting in the middle of the best experts in a government, I can tell you we will be punished, we will be voted out. What will you be doing? if there is a new government, a coalition, and you still have 80,000 Russian soldiers, the nuclear warheads in Hungary. And without hesitation, he grabbed the arms of his chair and said, until I am sitting in this chair, 1956 will not be repeated. It's a quite important sentence. A quite important sentence. Yeah. So I, when I got back home, I briefed the interior minister. You can start. There are photos in early March, late March, when the Hungarian guard, the border guard, started to pull down the Iron Curtain. No response from Moscow. No knocking on my doors from the from uh, on behalf of the ambassador or embassy. So no protest. 
although it was published, the photographs were published that time in the Hungarian papers. First test. Second test, when we, the government, made official the decision, and we published it. Again, no protest, no phone call. Third test, when the two foreign ministers, Alois Mok on the Austrian side and Dula Horn on the Hungarian side, they themselves physically went to cut some part of the barbed wire on the 27th of June. Again, no response, no protest. In June, July, the tourists from the former GDR, East Germany, right. East Germany, they, after their vacation, they decided to stay and wait. We had not counted their numbers, but I got reports from 40 to 150,000. So when the idea came up, to organize a pan-European picnic on the Austrian-Hungarian border and opening the gate for three hours to let the Austrian citizens to cross and the Hungarian citizens to cross the border, you know, to cook some good food from both and enjoying themselves, I wanted to make sure that over or during these three hours a few hundred East German uh, tourists can go through the, the gate, and they did it. And so, at that particular stage, um, if someone had said to you um, that, in fact, the wall was going to be dismantled on the 9th of November or whatever in that year, would you have believed it then? No, I, d I would not believe in that forecast or prediction that uh, when, 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 when after this picnic, you pan-European picnic, yeah. in my room I made the decision that we, we had to inform, call on our decision that we letting the East German citizens through to freedom. That was the momentum when I called up our ambassador to Bonn and I asked for a very special meeting with Cole. And it, it did happen on the 25th of August of that year. That was a secret call, a secret meeting. And I will never ever forget how Cole reacted to this. Tears in, in his eyes, in big emotional mood, he said, I will and the German people will never forget what you doing to us with this decision. And when I flew back, one of my advisors was sitting next to me. And you know what he told me? Look, Miklos, uh, that was me. Uh, <coughs> This was an important, a historical decision you made. I don't know, he's, yeah. he's talking, what will be the consec consequences of this within three to five to ten years' time frame. And it took only three months. So I would lie to you if I would say now that yes, I, I knew that time that the Berlin Wall will come down or fall. No one knew, no one knew. It was, it was an amazing show. And about that time, uh, Helmut Kohl was, was quoted as saying, it was in Hungary that the first stone was removed from the Berlin Wall. That's true, isn't it? That's true. And even he went further on, later on, when the unification happened, he said in his speech, the soil, I'm trying to translate it, uh, the soil under the Brandenburg Gate, the famous Brandenburg Gate, yes. is Hungarian soil. Really? Recognizing the very fact 
that we made a very important decision, pulling down the Iron Curtain first and then letting through the gates or the borders roughly 150, 160,000 East Germans. Miklos Nemeth there, the former Prime Minister of Hungary. And now I'm joined by Anne McElvoy of the Evening Standard, who reported on the fall of the Berlin Wall for the Times at the time, and she spent a great deal of time since then reporting on Eastern Europe. At that time, you were there. Were you, like we heard from our distinguished guests, were you surprised by the speed of it all? I was surprised by the speed of the fall of the wall. I wasn't surprised at the end by the collapse of the East German regime because there's every day something new was happening. There were more and more demonstrators. There was more and more pressure on the border. The Politburo had had to resign. It was clear that that regime could not continue. I don't think we thought that they'd tear down the wall, though. Absolutely. That was, that was so dramatic, too. And at the same time, do you think we talked about this to... Uh to our guests as well. Do you think that the people of Eastern Europe are all better off today? I think they are largely. Than before. Yes, I do think they are largely better off. I mean, there is a, a difference, if you like, between saying you can make incremental improvements in a dictatorship and actually having freedom. And that is the big difference for Eastern Europe. I mean, clearly there are some tensions. I mean, if we look at your nice map here, if you look at something like the whole of Yugoslavia as it was in mm. 1989 when I first covered it, it was one country, it was controlled out of Serbia and out of Belgrade. And as soon as the wall fell, the pressures then came from the nationalist movements in each country but really they didn't want to stay together and it was only this system that yoked them together that had kept it like that for 40 years and it was going to change. Is there anybody in this whole area here in the what was the communist world who yearned for the return of the communist world? Is well, there, there's Does some, anybody miss it? I think some people miss it. I think some older people miss the security of it, people who perhaps were in jobs that were not particularly productive but were part of the regime, who were maybe between 45 and 60 when the wall fell in the former East Germany perhaps miss it. And of course, if you look at something like Ukraine over here, you know, where there are tensions about how close it should remain to Russia, some people would say, well, we didn't have to think about that before. It was all easier before. But these, these are the problems of freedom, and previously you had the problems of dictatorship. So you don't think communism obviously will ever make a comeback in the countries where it, it's, it's not now. What about the three that people always quote? Will they st last out the 21st century as communists? I mean, Cuba and North Korea and China? Cuba, I think, will at some point after the, the Castro's, when the last Castro goes, I think Cuba will not retain a communist system. China is more complicated yeah. because, as, as you know, David, it has managed to combine well, nominally a communist regime with uh, some aspects of the free market, and I think it will go its own way. And North Korea is a very tragic country, I think, because it is, again, nominally communist, but really it is being run on a poverty economy uh, and a terrible tyranny, and I think one day that will crack too. And in fact, uh, George Bush was saying to us there that uh, he thinks definitely that it is a safer world today than it was 20 years ago, that the threat of nuclear war has receded and so on. Do you agree with that? I do agree with him in terms of the big picture. The threat of nuclear war uh, came to take it for granted, but it was very re real and it could indeed have, have turned very serious. Now, of course, we have many more small problems with more skirmishes inside countries and more uh, crises of nationality and nationalism. But these are small scale compared with the big clash of the superpowers. I don't think we'll see that again. And we wouldn't have seen a lot of what went, went on here if uh, Mikhail Gorbachev had not come to power in the then Soviet Union, would we? I mean, uh, Gorbachev changed absolutely everything. I was studying in East Germany when he came to power and began Perestroika. And the appetite for Gorbachev's reforms, which were not even uh, reported in the newspapers there, I used to have to smuggle in English language newspapers so people could read about them. That was really the change that awoke the appetite. It made people think you could have change within the communist system. That, of course, was you know, the first time that had happened since 1968 and the invasion of Czechoslovakia. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons why there was really relatively little uh, violence for this huge change and very little bloodshed, as George Bush was mentioning. Yes, that is Gorbachev's great achievement, that at no point did he signal that he was prepared to sanction the use of violence, troops, and ultimately shooting at protesters from Moscow. 
Previously, Moscow had always said, do what it takes to keep this system under lock and key. And he didn't do that. And I think with that, the, the sense that you could resist the change began to melt away, and the power moved to the streets, and we know the consequence. Anne, thank you very much for being with us. And, uh, and thanks to all my guests today, including former presidents Bush and Gorbachev. They came together for the fall of the Berlin Wall, and thanks to them, we're delighted they came together for this programme too. If you're celebrating the fall of the wall on Monday, have a wonderful, heartfelt time. From us all here, Auf Wiedersehen, goodbye for now.